Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Traders Talk. Traders Talk purpose is to give you the truth of trading by interviewing top traders who trade for real and give you different ways to trade the markets for consistent performance. Today's speaker is going to be Charlie Burton. Charlie Burton has been trading 24 years. His career started in financial services prior to going full-time trading in 2001. He is an FCA regulated money manager, as well as being co-founder of Easy Trader. Charlie is well known for putting his neck on the line and trading live in front of audiences, having been undefeated five years running at the London Forex show Live Trade Off. He's also done numerous trading challenges, such as the $10,000 to $100,000, and is currently doing one currently where he's up 160% in just eight months. You may have also seen Charlie feature in the BBC documentary Traders Millions by the Minute, where they not only filmed him trading, but also washing his car. Charlie lives in Newbury with his wife, Rachel. Charlie, what a pleasure to have you on board. Hi, Thero. Craig, that was quite an introduction there. Thank you for that. Very kind. (laughs) I don't know about the washing the car bit, though. (laughs) Yes, as I was reading that, I was like, oh, wow, okay, that that sounds really real, doesn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyway, it's very nice to have you on board here on Traders Talk. Um, So as we go in, yeah, thanks. So as we're going in, I just wanted to first just a little bit get a, a little bit of your background, actually, right? So before we go into the nitty gritty details. Um, So tell me, like, how did you get into this whole world of trading? Like, how old were you when you started? What event triggered your interest? Uh, And do you do other things uh, when you're not trading? What are the things you do? Um, Yeah, what got me into trading? I was, I think I was around about 24, so quite young, really. I was, as you said in your introduction, I was in financial services. I was working at a company called Scottish Provident at the time. And my, I was basically an account manager. So I used to go and advise independent financial advisors on the products that Scottish Provident had, investments, pensions, and insurance related products as well. Things like critical illness insurance as well. So so that when those financial advisors are advising their clients, they they might say, "Oh, John Smith, you um, yes, you need a you need to have a you know a pension with Scottish Provident." It's because I've been in there telling him all about our pension and, and the various um, uh, benefits of of using a Scottish Provident pension. So that was my job as a technical account manager to independent financial advisors. So I. Um, used to look after, I don't know how many, maybe it was about 100 different financial advisors um, along the Thames Valley area. And I got to know, obviously, these these financial advisors very well over the years. And so some of them are still close friends of mine that I go skiing with to this day. And um, it was actually one of the financial advisors who said to me, this is back in 97, um, said, Charlie, I've got two tickets to go on this, go on a, tr- a stock trading course. Do you, do you okay. want to come? And I thought, oh, that'd be cool. I've always wanted to, you always think back in the, I remember going to university in the early 90s thinking, oh, I've, I could take a student loan out because I didn't need it at the time and maybe invest it in the stock market, but I didn't know anything about investing in the stock market, so I didn't do it. But um but yeah, so I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. So I went along with Rob and and that's what got me into it. So it's purely by chance that I was asked if I wanted to come along because one of my financial advisors was going, as it turns out. So we went on that course with a couple of other people as well, as it turns out. And Rob, who invited me to come along with him uh, in the first place, within about two months, he'd already stopped. <laughs> and um, and then I sort of continued with it. So he was busy. We're all busy. But um, he sort of lost interest and said, Oh, I haven't got the time. And you know, um, this was all swing trading back then buying stocks, holding them for several months at a time. And then sometimes writing call options against those stocks. So uh, doing covered calls and stuff like that. So um, that was my introduction into trading so it was um yeah quite a while ago now but um that's how i got into it by like by chance like a lot of people get into our world of trading by chance and so and that was how it happened to me oh interesting okay yeah it's always interesting when you reflect back how everything connects together isn't it yeah like as if there's some 
very intelligent orchestrator orchestrating these events. Um, very nice. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. How you were an account manager and then you went to stock market course and then you kept on with it and then here you are today. Well, the, the funny thing is uh, that I didn't, when I went, I always like to impress this upon people because people think, oh, you went on it and you became a full time trader and stuff. I never, even when I went on that course and even after I'd come off that course, I had no intention of becoming a full time trader at the time. So I saw it as like many, I guess a lot of people who get into trading as something to do on the side for my career because I loved my career. But as you said, sometimes there's who's pulling the strings out there on your in your life because fast forward five years or four and a half years after that event, there I was quitting my career, which I had loved. But the irony was I was competing at international level in martial arts so I was having to be fit and healthy for that but at the same time I did a lot of um, corporate entertaining with my financial advisors and so there was this conflict of interest where I was doing more and more corporate entertaining but I wanted to be fit and healthy for uh, my karate at the time and I didn't and, and, and it was falling apart in that regard. I wasn't getting that balance. So as it turned out, I never had an intention of becoming a full-time trader, but by hook or by crook or by a bit of luck, if you want to look at it now, but it was just that my, my corporate career was getting so busy that I felt that my life was out of balance. And I thought, mm. well, I've been trading on the side for four and a half years now, which isn't a long time, as you know, but mm. um, I'd been trading on the side. And I thought, well, I'm going to take a year, 18 months out and see if I can make the transition from you know being in a corporate um, to becoming a full-time trader. So yeah, it wasn't even, um, it, uh, certainly at outset, it wasn't intended that I was going to become a full-time trader. It's just the way that events had took place. That's really good, um, Charlie. I mean, it makes it really real. I mean, as opposed to all the media hype of saying, you know, quit your job and overnight, you know, you can make these amounts or even in weeks. So it's always nice. Always when I talk to you, always one thing I really feel is uh, the genuine side of it, the reality of it. And that's what we like to paint as well. That's why we always say that we're here to spread the truth of trading. So thanks for sharing that. Now, Going into the concept of your style of trading and all that, so what would you say is your main style of trading? Are you like a swing trader, a scalp trader, a position trader? Do you do intraday trading mainly? So what, what do you do? Tell us a bit. Um, well, I think that many traders evolve over the years, and certainly that's been the case for myself. I went from starting out as purely as a swing trader, trading in stocks, as I just said, um, and then... By the time I went full-time trading, then I was trading stock market indices and currencies. This was into, this was the beginning of, oh, sorry, late 2001, once I went full-time trading. Um, and then when I went full-time trading, I was almost, well, you know, predominantly 80% day trading and with a bit of swing trading. And then gradually as the years have gone on, I've done more, I've split it. So I've done, you know, more, more of both day trading and swing. Um, and certainly during the financial crisis, I was doing a lot of scalping. So uh, at that point, you know, you had these huge ranges at that time in the currency markets and in the stock markets as well in, 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 at that point. And um, so you, as you probably remember, you could get into a trade and be out, you know, 60 seconds later with a 50 pip move. <laughs> mm. um, it doesn't happen very often these days when you get that sort yeah. of stuff, but this was happening all day long. And so, um, so yeah, I was more of a scalper at that point. But then as we got past the financial crisis, then I went to more just normal sort of day trading and swing trading again. So certainly for a couple of years there, my swing trading was parked because the, the daily ranges you look at the daily range on the euro dollar at that time with 250 pip daily range went up to 300 pips or so at one point so i didn't need to uh to swing trade so um but nowadays um i would define myself mostly as a swing trader but with but i use intraday charts to get me get myself entries a lot of the time so but mostly i'm analyzing the markets on a swing basis and then I'll use um, hourly charts, four hourly charts to then actually gain an entry. So uh, that's that's how a lot of the time, not always, some of the swing trades are literally just using end of day charts. But um, as I'm here and I'm in my office every day, 
um, then certainly um, if I see an opportunity to uh, to get in on a on a trade which is in the direction of my overall analysis and it's something happening on an hourly chart, for example, then I will take the opportunity. So that's really what I do most of the time now. I'm, I'm, I, call, I, I'd, I wouldn't define myself as an outright day trader by any means anymore, although I am... I'm in front of my screens right now. You know, I'm, I'm seeing what I see what's going on intraday, but I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, look, there's a little setup on a five minute chart, um, you know, day in, day out. Uh, when I'm in with my trading room with my traders, then I might be doing some of that. But outside of that, then reality is um, I don't have the time to sit there day trading or the inclination anymore. I think there's, for me, for me and my life, there's better ways to, trade the markets. Now, again, I think trading is very personal. And so what's right for me might not be right for someone else. But I needed, again, coming back to balance, really, after all those years and years of trading, that I, we got into sort of 2014 or, or so, 2013 or 14, um, I realized that actually I can combine my trading so that I don't have to be sat there for 10 hours a day, day trading sort of thing. You know, you, you don't, don't need to do that. And so I can come and go at my own leisure and pop trades on. And then if I can get a trade on and then hold it for sometimes just a couple of days or so. But uh, my favorite trades are the trades that I hold for multi-weeks. Those are my favorite trades. Interesting. Yes, I think most traders, I think if you see the journey, even ourselves as well, is the evolution of us and how we change our style of trading as we evolve. And I think more and more we um, trade, we start to realize, especially for myself and what you're sharing over here is that um, if we can make more money by doing less, why not? And that's how we start to evolve. And most of us actually go into swing trading, but some do keep on the scalping and all of that. As you said, trading is personal, but is, there's definitely an evolution. Most of the traders that we've interviewed and we come across this doesn't stick to the first one that they began with. You know, moving on, Charlie, is that in terms of entry, so we just want to understand, I mean, that's how this interview will be like, we go into different categories, entry, and then your stop loss and your target. Then if there's time, we can go into the practical side. But in terms of the category on the entry um, questions, would you say there's like a concept? Is there like a concept to all your trade setups that you take? Um, I guess there is a concept overall. Uh, the concept really is that I use multiple time frame analysis. Okay. So, uh, again, for me and my style, and this is uh, as uh, I've just been talking to a load of traders all morning. So, if you have to excuse me if my voice is getting croaky because I've been talking non stop for four hours, but um, and I was saying to them, um, there is no right or wrong way to trade. It's what's right for you as an individual. And so for me, what's right for me is I like to use multiple time frame analysis. So I'll look at monthly chart, weekly chart, daily chart, for example, to build a picture. And that would form the concept for the trades that I'm taking. So I need, even if I'm trading off an hourly chart, I need to know that I'm tra taking that trade being well aware of what my bigger picture analysis is. So that's, for me, the biggest concept, if you will, is uh, multiple time frame analysis, forming a view based on the higher time frames, and then trading within that view on the smaller time frames, I guess. And so to say, okay, well, I've got a view on a particular market, which on the bigger time frames is, is up. So where possible, if I even if I am trading down to an hourly chart or off a four hour chart, I'm normally going to be trading in the direction of, of my overall analysis. So that would be my overall concept there for, um, uh, for looking for trades. Well, Charlie, would you say that most of your um, entries are retracement entries or would you say it's a breakout entry? Mm, they're more likely going to be retracements. So... Um, um, there now and again, there's certain patterns that I'll look at, which might, you know, warrant a, a, a breakout. Funnily enough, I shorted Euro dollar last Thursday, and that was sort of a, a breakout of a little consolidation area. But um, but that's not very common. Most of my trades are um, I, where I'm. A market's already had a bit of a run in a in a given direction, and then I'm looking for a pullback within that direction to 
to then um, to then get my position on. So there's only so many ways you can actually buy the market, aren't there? You either, exactly. you either buy a pullback or you buy a breakout. There's not many that you can do, or you might be looking off a reversal off, off of a low or a high. So, uh, but yeah, for a lot of those sort of trades, then it, it would be a pullback, but I do trade off of sort of double bottom type uh, patterns as well. So um, there are reversal type patterns that I will trade. Okay, yeah, fair enough. But more or less, you're always looking to get in as near as possible to the um, swing low or the swing high, depending on your direction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what would you say your typical trade entry looks like for any one of your strategies? Um, a typical trade entry. Um, for, well, um, would you say something like maybe the monthly is, let's say, they all got to be all uptrend or maybe, you know, um, even. Yeah. If- yeah. Um, um, well, I mean, I'm trying, you're saying because it says typical, I mean, because I have different setups for different market environments, but mm-hmm. I mean, I can show you my charts and, um, and pick out something if you want to, but maybe you want to do that in a bit, but otherwise, um, yeah, a typical sort of entry would be, um, okay. So let's take something like, euro dollar let me give you an i'll tell you a story around euro dollar so you you know euro dollar peaked back on the 6th of january this year so it had to Charlie, i'm sorry if you think that sharing a screen might help i mean uh, go for it i mean yeah, i leave okay. it up to you yeah um, um so if you think that's easier i'll just stop my share and i think you should be able to share now okay let's do that Everyone listening in, I think if you um, can hear and see uh, Charlie's screen, just type in yes. I think that'd be great. And if you've got any questions as well, um, attendees, you know, just put it into the chat box. We'll look at it later. Okay. Yeah. People are saying yes. Okay. Go for it, Charlie. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, just get rid of that chat box there. Um, so, yeah, um, the euro peaked here um, in January. So, if I just start out at a monthly chart, um, I'm not going to go into too much analysis, but I know I've got a lot of trend lines on my chart here. But just bear, just remember that red horizontal line there, because that marries up with all of these old lows going way back. And I do like trend line analysis and um, whether it trend line or support and resistance zones. So, and I've got another one a bit below, and I've got some channels on there as well. So if I now take us to, so I'm I'm often looking at you know, where we are relative to highs and lows, of course, like te- standard sort of analysis. You can now see that high there from, from early January. So I'll take us to the daily chart and then we'll come back. And so when we were coming into late December, now bearing in mind, I'd been long for much of last year with um, my swing traders um, on the euro dollar. And we'd only come out of the final uh, longs into sort of, I don't know, mid December, I think it was. And, um, and then when we, so I was getting a bit concerned that that everyone was all of a sudden starting to talk about uh, how the dollar's demise. <laughs> and for me, I'm a technical trader, but I'm also very much a sentiment trader as well. So when everyone, when I start reading and seeing headlines you know, on you know Bloomberg, CNBC, and the likes, and the usual talking heads talk, starting to talk about all collectively the dollar's demise, and I'll just Google it. So when I know we've had an great trend like we had last year just started googling the dollar you know and then you can see all these articles into the into right into the end of the year last year all talking about how the dollar will continue to uh to sell off coming into next year so mm-hmm. i.e the euro dollar carry on going higher mm-hmm. so that's the first warning flag from a sentiment perspective and then between christmas and new year uh, Citibank put out a target on euro dollar of 125 and then Goldman's on the, I think it was the 28th of Jan put out a, a revised target of 128 when Goldman's going to do that, you know, you should be selling. So, cause you know what they, they get up to. It's not that they're bad analysts. They, 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 they're, they're one of the most successful investment banks for a reason. And, and so they will sometimes put out um, investment advisories for their own benefit, as you know. So, I took that and that information the amount, about the amount of uh, uh, discussions around the dollar and the dollar carry on going down, i.e. the euro dollar going higher, as a potential um, for the, the dollar to actually have a, a bit of a bounce. 
mm-hmm. and i.e. the euro dollar to come down. So from a sentiment perspective, that those are some of the factors that I would uh, I was looking at. Plus, you've got that combined with the fact that the euro is coming in to this key res- resistance line, as I've already highlighted on the monthly chart. So then, what I'm 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 copy I'm uh, I'm aligning uh, sentiment along with technicals, and mm. then as far as typical sort of trade entries are concerned. Um, I will use, you can see I've got some moving averages on my chart and I have a a standard MACD down the bottom. So I'll look for things like divergences into a key level. And that was what we had. So the MACD was diverging, the signal lines were diverging down here at that time as we were coming in up into those highs there. And we were also diverging very clearly on the weekly chart at that time as well. So then what I'm doing is taking that information um, from a sentiment perspective, and then also combining that with technical analysis. So then I'm then I'm in a position to say, right, we've, we're up against key support here. Oh, sorry, resistance and um, sentiment is a bit frothy at the moment in relation to the euro dollar, and um, and I've also got the, all these these divergences and stuff going on as well. So that would be a, a typical sort of uh, scenario. Now you don't get that all of the time where sentiment gets really frothy, but we've had it lately in, funny enough, in Bitcoin and crypto. But um, but certainly there at times that is an ideal time to trade. And so for me, so don't get me wrong, I can't do that all the time. That's, you know, wait all year for something like that to happen. But um, but when it does come along, that's quite a nice, nice thing. So that one was more of a reversal trade, but really off of, Know, quite a key significant long-term resistance there because so that's good. one one example that's great thanks for sharing that um charlie just to see that overall thing there is um, you're aligning the technicals and the sentiment that was very nice to to hear that just a very quick question charlie on that on entries do you scale into your trades at all or you don't um if i'm in a trend trade then i will scale in so a trade like this we're trading, I was trading up just around 123 initially. And then I'll add once it starts coming down in my favor. So I was adding around here, uh, around about 121.50 area, um, and then ran it down down to the 120. We can talk about exits in a bit. But um, as far as scaling in, if I'm in a trend-based trade, uh, like I was on the long side of Euro earlier last year, then... Um, I remember being in a trade here and taking an entry here. Um, and what I'll do, if I'm going to scale in, I'll come in with a small position initially, which enables me to add, if it comes that bit lower, down here and here. So I had a couple of other levels. So I'll, I'll put a small position in, which means that I'm not going to go over on my risk. Okay, so I'm always going to try and stay within a risk my risk allowances. So um, I'm not going to... I'm not just indiscriminately adding. This is pre-planned. So I've got a certain percentage that I'm coming in with here and I'll add if it comes lower. As it turns out, it didn't come lower. So, um, and then we add, we carried on. We started adding actually on strength uh, a month or so later. So yes, I will um, scale into trades, especially on a, I think on, a, on trend-based trades, you can't always know where it's going to turn and then mm-hmm. come back up. So I do like to have a couple of air entries um, where I've, rather than going all in at the first entry and then sitting underwater for ages, um, and I like to stagger my entries to get an overall better entry when it comes to uh, trend-based trades. But um, off the top or off a, off a reversal, then no, no need to scout. Okay, that's very interesting. That's good you shared that. I mean, we'll talk a bit more later on on that in terms of your scaling in. What would you say is your best trait to date so far? And what would you say your thinking was behind that entry? And of course, feel free to define best trade in your own terms. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I could talk about the the you know the when you say a best trade um, this was a very good trade off off of the here um, the run down at, at managing to add here and then carrying on down you know, when we came down to these highs and then taking all, most of the exits right down here that was a great trade ended up with a very high risk reward ratio trade but there's no point in me going through that because I've just sort of talked about that trade so I'm just going to pick one 
Um, as far as a significant trade is concerned, last year I was just trend trading all year long. And so we got lucky there last year. But really, one that still to this day, one of my favorite trades that I've taken in recent years was actually into, I'll, I'll pick this one out, this one in, it was Euro dollar again in 2017. I see, okay. And uh, if I go, actually, I'll go to the monthly chart actually. So it was down here in 2017. I was being um, interviewed on Tip TV at this time and the Euro dollar was sitting at around about 104 at the time. I think it had come down as low as 103 something, but it was down here. Now it was into this long-term trend line. So if I just, zoom the chart out We've got this long-term trend line going all the way back to 2000 so um it was trading around there at that time as we can see down here now it had already hit it a couple of times in previous in the previous couple of years um but again we were diverging down here something i use you know off of tops and bottoms if it's there if it's going on but again a bit like what i just talked about with what was happening with euro going into the beginning of this year um, at this point, everybody was talking about the euro going down to parity <laughs> um, mm. with the dollar. So, um, and I remember sitting on this interview uh, down in London and the interviewer was saying, right, so Charlie, how long do you think it's going to be um, before we get to parity? Because it's only a matter of time, Charlie, isn't it? And he was so adamant that we were going to parity mm -hmm. that I can sort of take, and he's interviewing loads of analysts, bear, bear in mind. He's interviewing traders and trader analysts all day long, every day. And they're all saying the same thing. So again, we're in a situation from a sentiment perspective where everybody is talking about Euro going to parity. And yet, so from a sentiment perspective, everybody's bearish, which will give me the heebie-jeebies because if everybody's bearish, who's left to sell, so to speak? Exactly. And then I've got that combined with, from a technical perspective, we're on a long-term trend line there, going back to 2000, and divergent activity going on as well. So it didn't feel comfortable in my gut, and some, but sometimes those are the best trades, aren't they? So because you know you feel like you're going against the, the collective wisdom of everybody because everyone's saying it's a shoe and even I was thinking surely it's going to go down there but I still had to put the trade on and it turned out to be end up being a cracker of a trade through 2017 so I'll use that one as my as example but again it's these trades when when the stars do align you know you, I do you know standard sort of trades all of the time uh you know with standard sort of setups but it's when you do get an emotional market, um, so sentiment is high, combined with bigger term uh, fractal uh, technicals um, that I find it really interesting. So that's why I remember that one so well, because um, because everything was aligned that year. And um, and it meant when you've got sentiment so extreme like that, it meant that there, it had a good chance of a good run. Bear in mind, I'd got in somewhere in the 105, 06 area initially. And that ran all, and I, well, actually I only, I think I only ran it, well, I ran it to 114 and 117. So I didn't take the whole, I mean, it ended up going up to 125 or whatever, but um, I, I don't care about that. Um, that's not my trade. My trade was to my levels that I exited at. So um, that was a good trade. That's really good. That was nice that you um, shared that. I think that point where you said, but you're going against your own self because Everybody wants to sell. And even in your mind, you're thinking, man, this might go to parity. But the time when you can counteract your own thinking and go against your own intuitive feeling and what the charts are saying, and usually you're right, Charlie, that's one of the best traits, is it not? I, I'm sure you have experienced that time and again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when it's, when it's uncomfortable in the pit of your stomach, usually they're the ones you don't want to take them from, an, uh, from that perspective. Um, but that's why um, I spend so much time, you know, working on mindset and stuff. So that, so that, you know, whereas the average trader would just bottle it and not trade, I'll actually embrace it. There was something um, when I used to compete, like I said, in martial arts earlier on, when I used to compete uh, many years ago, when I used to train, They'd, you'd reach a point and it doesn't matter what exercise you do, but it's, I've done CrossFit and stuff as well. And it's the same sort of thing. You can get halfway into a class, whether it's 
me in a karate class years ago or CrossFit class. And your body wants to quit. You're getting really tired. And the best people, I, what I noticed when I was younger in martial artists and martial arts, and I noticed, you know, the guys who were like on the team back then when I was still young, they would sort of find a second gear. When everyone else was starting to fatigue, they would up it. And they would, and it's almost like you can, ne- you know, when you're tired, mm. so you can say, right, I'm really shattered now. My body wants to stop. Right. Okay. Let's go again. And, and I think that you see, we certainly see that a lot with sport, professional sports people, but also in trading there that when your stomach feels that way, say embrace it, embrace the uncertainty, so to speak. And, um, you know, you still got risk management and everything in place. So it's just, it's just uh, embrace it. So I thrive on um, putting myself outside of my comfort zone, I guess. That's interesting. I mean, that you shared that because in our recent interview, Steve Ward as well on the um, psychology side of things, he did say, get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's nice that you reiterated ah, that point. Yeah. And um, we'll be talking more of that in the psychology side. Just quick on swiftly moving into the stop loss category um, of questions. Just want to know from your idea, do you use stops? And if you do, then where do you usually place your stops usually? Yeah, always use stops. I'm a big proponent and advocate of using stops. I know there's plenty of people who would argue against that, but I um, emphatically believe that you should use stops because when you speak to traders and they say, I use a mental stop, um, Mm. then you sort of think, well, yeah, well, what happens if it goes to your mental stop? Do you get out there and then? What if it flushes through? Do you then start to think, oh, no, I'm not going to, I'll hold it for a little bit longer and see if it comes back up. You know, Mm. it's it's too much discretion at that point. So, so yeah, I'm I'm not an advocate of that at all. So yes, I use them. And um, it depends, again, depends on the trade, but usually behind a, especially off a reversal, it will be, you know, off that, high there earlier this year the stop will just be above the high and uh, or below the low if it's off a reversal if i'm in a trend based trade then the stop's more likely going to be further away so um i'll use my my time frame analysis to say like when i took this trade back here if i bring the pen up um when i got into this trade sort of here last year my stop loss was sort of initial stop loss was down here because i was still looking to add I don't know, here and here, if it had come down that little bit more. So the stop was much further away in that. In And it's, it's not below a certain technical low because the last technical low is way too far away. So um, the answer is it does depend. Um, but, the, but when I'm manually trading, wherever my stop is, the trade's got to work from a risk to reward ratio overall. So I always want a positive risk to reward ratio. So if I go and put my stop too far away and let's say my target's here, then, well, and if the risk to reward ratio is no good, then I won't bother taking the trade. So it will just discount the trade overall. So it has to work. So if this, if I feel that I need to have a stop down here to make the trade work, but my target's only here, well, I'm never going to take the trade. I'll just move on and just say that trade's not for me. So, yeah, sometimes technically off a, coming off a low. Other times it might be um, further away just to give it room to breathe. And usually, you know, Charlie, your stops, your initial stops, like what you mentioned for the scaling in, is that is it usually based on a technical level um, or um, is it based on a money le- money based stop? What is it based? No, it's on? not it based on money. I'll just I'll just position size differently to as regards to money. So the money itself is irrelevant. So it's always about either a technical stop, like I said, above a high or whatever. Now that that stop, I've just gone out to a weekly chart just to remind myself of that particular trade there last mm-hmm. year. Um, most certainly I was, I was still using a technical level, but I'll be using a, like a moving, moving averages and I'll pop oh. my stops. Mate, I can't remember if it was off the weekly or the monthly at the time now, but I'll pop my stops the other side of a key moving average. It might've been there because um, it was around about 114. So yeah, I think it was just the other side of this monthly 50 moving average. So where possible, it will be the other side of a, a technical low. Um, and I'm not bothered about stop runs and things like that. Uh, that doesn't 
bother me. If if there's going to be a stop run down to a level that I've got to stop at, so be it. If the trade was good and it turns back up, then I can always get back in. I, I don't fear that type of stuff. When people get too caught up in conspiracy theories about markets out to get you and you know get yeah. your stops and stuff. But um, so yeah, generally speaking, if I'm trading a reversal, then I can usually get the stop because I'm not getting in at the re- reversal itself. I'm waiting for that for it for for it to have already started to turn up a little bit. So if it's a buy, so then I'll put the stop below the low. Um, if it's in a trend, then um, the stop is more likely to be, you know, like I say, further away. And if it is further away, like in that example there, then it's more likely to be below one of my key moving averages. Okay. And, you know, as you go into the trade, as it goes in your favor, then how do you then usually trail your stops? Are you using a time stop, a money stop, or a technical stop usually? Um, I... I don't, it's more likely going to be something like a technical stop. So when I trail stops, now the reason I pause there is because I don't trail stops that aggressively. <laughs> so, um, because when I get into a trade, I've learned over the years, and again, this is my style. I would rather see when I took this trade here, um, and then we added over here, I was sat in this trade for a month before it finally then started to break up. And then we added, I added up here somewhere. So, um, I won't move my stop and start trailing it up too aggressively, whereas a lot of traders would do. They'd say, right, okay, it's coming up. Right, I'm going to move my stop to here. Then it comes up a little bit further, and maybe they move their stop to here. Okay, maybe they end up with a tiny little profit out of the trade um, as it comes down and trading stops them out. But I I tend to prefer to give my, my trades more room to breathe but that all comes back down to that multiple time frame analysis. So if the bigger time frames look, you know, they you know, that's what I'm basing my trades on, they're up. I have to put up with wiggle room and retracements on the the daily charts let's say. So um so I don't trail too aggressively. Um but once I do move them up then usually it would be below um, yes, a technical low. Once I do start trailing, then it would be below the normal sort of stuff, below a technical low or below a moving average again. So, um, but I'm not too aggressive. Um, even once I'm a, a decent amount into profit, I'm not too aggressive because what I find is you get, what traders do is you get into a nice amount of profit. And I've been in six figure profit trades um, over the years and then seen that come all the way back down <laughs> but um, or come down down a, a reasonable amount but if you it, i've always found that if i trail my stop too aggressively i'm never going to get those six figure trades actually if i if i trail too 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 much unless you're really lucky and you have a market that just goes like this one where it never look back you know just day after day after day so most of the time, the markets, they breathe in, breathe out, and they retrace and move forward again. So I want to give them that room to be able to do that. So, um, so yeah, so in the main, I, um, um, I, I, I tend to give them more, more space than, than, a, than more space than a lot of them in that I won't start that engaging of trailing that stop too soon. Most people, once they're into profit, they don't want to see that profit roll back. That's the counter to what I do. I understand why people do that. They don't want to see their open profit come back. And a lot of people will tell them that. And I don't care. That's fine. But, um, and, you know, they'll still take points and money out of the markets by by aggressively trading. But um, it's very rare that you're going to get those big runs if you don't get, if you don't give uh, uh, your trade space to breathe and put up with seeing yourself in you know ten thousand pounds worth of open profit to then come all the way back to down to you know one thousand pounds to then go all the way back up and and end up being a thirty thousand pound trade you know you, you've got if you just choke your trades all of the time you're never going to have a thirty thousand pound trade so that's my sort of philosophy but again that's my philosophy it's what i do and i appreciate that not everyone's going to want to um uh, give back their open profits, but I'll give back the open profits for the potential to make that bigger profit. Makes sense. I think it was very um, well said, and I guess every strategy is um, is going to be different. And you yeah. she nicely said, 
you have to be psychologically prepared that if you are going to ride higher time frames, that you have to see your open profit diminish and come back even more bigger than ever before. So that people have to know and they have to know how their trades are going to behave before they get involved in higher time frame kind of trading. And as you nicely say, Charlie, you've got used to this type of trading and that's your personality and it's got its pros and it's got its cons. Yeah, definitely. Right. So it's um very, very well said. I mean, just on later on after that, I mean, just a very quick one, just to touch on, how do you do your risk management? Is it on percentage? Do you do a, just a typical percentage risk management? I do. Yeah. So um, depending on what accounts I'm trading on, I've trade a number of accounts. I trade um, uh, the funds, for example, they're very low. Uh, and my pension money, I call it my pension account. Um which is my main trading account. I only trade at very low risk as far as and as a percentage of my overall account balance. So I'm more trading at like 0.1 of 1% on that. Whereas when I'm trading, doing a trading challenge, as you talked about at the beginning, then I'll trade 1% on, you know, on, on, on the majority of trades. So 1% of account balance. But yes, it, the risk is always based on an, a percentage of, of total funds. Okay. Quickly, um, just one of the last questions to wrap up this category over here on stop loss. What would you say is the trick that taught you the biggest lesson? <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Well, there's been plenty of lessons. I'm sure you've had a few as well. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's the, the biggest lesson for me was I was always, and I still am, it's in my DNA, uh, what I call a greed based trader. And so in my sort of second year of trading, second or maybe it was probably yeah into my third year of trading actually, um, I was I'd, I'd learned how to make money, so I'd learned how to trade over that first couple of years, but my account balance I'd gone through this period where I'd made some money, but my account balance was sort of doing this. It was going up, but the the ups and the and the downs were still quite uh, in my equity were still. So overall, yes, it, my account balance was going up and I was adding to my funds through work and stuff. But on my actual trades, this was sort of the pattern I was in. And my sort of light bulb moment was here and here and here. And it was only once I'd been through this many, many times that I'd noticed the pattern. I was getting overconfident, overconfident over here. So I'd have, I'd trade really nicely with good discipline through this sort of section then naturally after a number of winning trades i'd start to get overconfident then you start take I'd, i would start taking trades that i wouldn't have wouldn't have taken back here and then i'd say oh this looks like it's going to go i'll just trade this or i would revenge trade a little bit you know i wasn't like a complete um wasn't completely ridiculous trading at that point but enough to give back my profits you know you'd have that attitude of oh well i've got a load of open profit it doesn't matter and then before you know it you realize you've given you know a large chunk of that open profit back so that was my that was the biggest lesson for me was really taking care of my greed my natural desire and propensity to to get greedy and so and i still have to keep that in check to this day and um, probably one of the best things that I've I've had over the years is is having the trading room because that's because I'm having to demonstrate my trade live in front of the clients um, having to demonstrate um, discipline and um, and so that was that was a really good thing for me as well but um, but certainly I, that was my light bulb moment years and years ago was getting overconfident and then all of a sudden you just start trading too loose so um so yeah if, if that answers your question yeah definitely i mean interesting it's um, it's nice that you shared that and i think that's something that everybody has got to be aware of i mean especially i mean for us over here as well we always get aware of that and if you're not getting too overconfident i mean usually what happens with most traders is that they make it they make all that money and they give it all back. And that's the most painful thing. And that's what they have to realize and get aware and know um, when to stop and when to take the trades and which are the ones that they really are looking for. So thanks for sharing that. Now we move on to the target category of questions, um, Charlie. Uh, 
would you say that you have a predefined target for all your trades or do you exit live on your trades based on certain parameters or you exit based on discretion? So what is it actually? No, it's always, for me, it's always target-based. I appreciate some traders have a, a, tra a trading stop is their exit and that is a strategy by itself. Um, and I've got trader friends who, who actually do that. But um, for me, I'm always at outset, I already know what my target is pretty much going to be. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm very much a target based trader. And that target will come from my overall analysis. So at the time you're doing your analysis for entry, you should be doing your, your analysis for your exit as well. Too many traders focus on finding the next trade and they get into the trade and then they start thinking about, oh, where should I exit? <laughs> Whereas for me, no, it's, and I'm sure you know, for you and what you do as well, that we get into our trade knowing what our exit is going to be. So, um, so yes, it's always target based. And that target will come, uh, like I said, from that analysis. It could be an old high, a technical high if it's a buy, or it could be a moving average on a much bigger time frame, right the way out to a quarterly chart, for example. Um, because I'm a big user of moving averages, as you can see on my chart, um, uh, markets like to retrace to their average price. I was just talking about this this morning. And so um, they like to mean revert. And so I could be in a trend-based trade, let's say on um, this euro dollar going up, and um, yeah, it's a trend, it's upwards trend on the daily charts and the weekly charts. You go out to the quarterly chart and it's just doing a retracement to its quarterly 50. Mm -hmm. So um, so yes, I will look at moving averages for where there are certain times when I'll be looking for um, a market to retrace to a key moving average, like a 50 or a 200, something like that. So, um, but yes, always looking for a target at outset. So, you know, on, on, on this target thing, I mean, if you were to put it into this current trade, I mean, are you still riding the euro dollar short or you've come out of it? No, um, I'm, 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 I'm in again. I mean, as we speak, I shorted with our traders in our trading room, fun enough, back last Thursday, mm -hmm. um, about 122 um, area. And I'm sitting in a short at the moment because my, my overall view of this euro is, I don't think it's quite done yet on the downside. I might be wrong, of course, but then again, I might have been wrong before. And you, I think the other thing is, I always say, it doesn't matter if you are wrong because I only need to be right, you know, a, a given percentage of the time. It's just that when I am right, I will capitalize on it. And so, um, and that's the main difference. That I'll make more from those wins, much, much more than I will do on my, on, when I'm losing. So don't get me wrong, I'll have plenty of losers but when I am right, then I'll get them. So, yes, um, at the moment, as far as I'm concerned with this euro dollar, I'm targeting it to come back down to my red horizontal line down here. And you can see that I've got this. I haven't got it right at the high. Well, we've already done that high when we retraced here in, into the beginning of February. So I'm sliced. I, like, I slice where I'm getting the most touches, which is fairly common. People do that sort of thing. Um, so I'm looking around about 119, but I am also got, I've also got other levels below that. That's if we come down. So if we are going to come down, then those are the sort of levels I'm going to be looking towards scaling out, fun enough, and, and, and targeting. So yes, I already have uh, the 119 zone is my first target, and I've got some other targets below that if it can push a little bit lower. Interesting you say that, Charlie, because um, even in our elite room, uh, we were looking into euro dollar short. So we got some levels to, to get in into that short and also correlating that with a weekly. So that's good. Thanks for sharing that, that you're looking at a target based on the last um, resistance point becoming support. Yeah, it, exactly uh, that. Yeah. On on. Right. Great. Um, think, ah, here's one question that, you know what? Um, I actually saw this thing being stated by one of the traders interviewed in the new market visits. And he said one of the litmus tests that he has for doing well and being in line with his entire trading methodology and trading strategies is that he asks himself, does he feel at peace when he exits most of his trades. In other words, uh, does he feel any kind of regret sometimes for coming out early or late from his trades or does he absolutely feel at peace? What would you say that would be for you? Would you say that most of the time when you exit, you, you feel at peace or do you sometimes get some regrets? 
I never have regrets. Um, I don't care. What, one thing is I won't jump out of a trade early. What I mean by that is before my target. It's, it's I can't, that sort of thing just won't happen. So if I come out at my target and then let's say I'm in a, let's say, okay, so let's say this, take this short here on this euro dollar. So let's take this. And I've targeted this level here and I come out, you know, with the majority of my trade at this point, and then the euro carries on coming all the way down to let's say 113 by the end of this year. Will I have regrets on that? No. Um, I, what I say to myself is that wasn't my trade. My trade was this, was this move here. I don't regret coming out at my targets, even if a market goes flying and carries on going beyond it. I just say that that, that didn't belong to me. That belonged to some other trader who had a different piece of analysis. That wasn't my analysis. So, no, I don't. I, I, I mean, everyone's different. I don't tend to have regrets because I guess because I'm always talking to myself. There's constant chatter going on from a side trader mindset going on. So I have so much of my trades are all planned out. And then once I'm in my trades, I'm constantly going back over my analysis to support the decision making that I'm doing. So, um, so no, I, I know it sounds a bit textbook, but uh, no, I don't, um, I, I don't have regrets, even if a, a market carries on going on and on and on. The only time that I might have some mild frustration is if I'm trying to get into a market and it's just not letting me in. You know, you put some orders in to get in on a pullback and it doesn't quite get to your order level, then away it goes. Funny enough, happened to me today. And um, when I was trying to do a day trade this morning, it just didn't, I think it missed an entry by two pips, you know, um, with these day traders this morning. But, um, but that's when you can sometimes feel some mild frustration. But, um, but again, I just talk, you know, it's this constant chitter chatter that I'll have and just say, well, it's, if I think that, you know, with, with, 20 odd years experience I'm just so used to just saying well that trade obviously wasn't for me it wasn't meant to be for whatever reason that trade wasn't meant to be for me so I just move on and there and there'll always be another trade and that's what you have to say to yourself brilliant Charlie I think you really hit it um, on the head you know I think that acceptance that you know yeah. that wasn't your trade um, you just followed your plan and that is a trade for another trader it just doesn't fit with your trading plan I think even that acceptance um, takes a while to come yeah. and uh, yeah and that is in alignment with what we just said when that comes you know you just stick to your plan and you feel at peace almost more and more of your traits as you come out thanks for sharing that that was really good um, the last part is the psychology side we want to ask you on which is do you have any like specific pre-trading routine before you start trading no Oh, okay. <laughs> not really not anymore because i'm trading 24 hours a day theory okay. so okay. and i'm trading seven days a week and what i mean by that is i i live and breathe trading so there isn't a start to my day um in it as such you know where i wake up when i went to bed and i wake up and the analysis is still there from the prior day so it's just a case of well what's gone on overnight but um I don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, years ago, I did used to have a, a little routine I created for myself just to do a little bit of visualization, especially more so for obviously for day trading, a little bit of visualization. I don't, I think that's good advice for to visualize yourself executing well, um, visualize yourself being disciplined and um, following your processes, visualizing, seeing, losing trades visualize your account and seeing that red <laughs> because if you can get if used to seeing that when it actually happens you accept it you just talked mm. about acceptance you're accepting of it because you've seen it in your visualization over and over it's not like you're trying to manifest it i'm just it sounds a bit pessimistic visualizing that but i think that that's a good thing to do um, one of the old uh sayings is um you know, professional tra amateur traders think about how much money they can min win and professionals think about how much they can lose, you know. And so it's not being pessimistic. It's just being real and setting yourself up. Because if you set yourself up for uh, mentally to accept that you might have 
that losing trade or a couple of losing trades on that particular day, then if it does happen, it's like water off. A, it's much more likely to be water off a duck's back rather than you sit in there at the beginning of the day saying, I hope I don't lose. I hope I don't lose. And then if you lose, then that creates a load of emotion and uh, disappointment, depression, whatever you want to call it. Um, that doesn't really help you going forward because then you're going to be carrying that emotional baggage going forward. So, yes, a bit of visualization, I think is good, but I don't really do that anymore because I I'm one, I'm not outright day trading most of the time. And if I'm in our day trading room, I, I am doing a bit, but um, but even then, a lot of the day trades I do, we'll get in and then we're trying to run them for a day or two anyway. So um, I don't um, I don't feel like I need it. Most of the time, I'm, I, I'm literally, I could be with my wife at the weekends and having a conversation with her and I'm still thinking about the markets and thinking about the various interplays that's going on. Um, and so I'm constantly living and breathing the market really but that's just what i like because i'm passionate about it and mm. i understand that other people don't look at the markets that way i see it as it's a constant challenge and that's what i enjoy about it i know other for other people it's just a means to make money whereas for me it's much deeper than that it's a bit like when i did martial arts all those years ago yes i managed to compete at quite a high level but I love the philosophy, the, the, philosoph <laughs> the, the philosophical <laughs> side of the martial arts. The fact that I was learning something and techniques that mm. were handed down through the generations and techniques which were thousands of years old. So um, there has to be a deeper meaning for me. And so for the trading, the shallow part is the same as competition karate. Yes, that's a bit of fun. That's the money side. But there's got to be more to it than just making money. And for me, it's the mental stimulus I get from planning out, doing all the analysis, and then sitting on these trades that you do get to run for multi-weeks and sometimes for you know a couple of months, and then being able to deal with sitting in on those tra the trades and not wanting to bank those profits when you're having a really nice profitable trade. So that, to me, is the, the real um, essence of trading. Thanks for um, putting all that um, together. And I think one thing that I do want to uh, call on with, you said that the visualization, a little bit of visualization that you used to do on the, the losses and just getting comfortable with it. You know, that's a very important point because you see the biggest fear that most traders have is losses. And if you get comfortable um, with that, then what's that to fear anymore? You become fearless. And yes. what that will do is that you won't miss on the next best trade that would be your biggest profitable trade as well. So I think accepting the most fearful thing can get you to fearlessness, which then gets you more consistent and at your peak performance. So it's very important. Yep. So thanks for sharing that um, on that. I mean, in terms of for your mind, for consistent execution, any practices that you do, because you always got to be in the present moment, you got to forget about, the last losses that you had or the biggest run that you have, do you do anything to keep the mind in the present moment? Um, well, I, I touched on this earlier on and I'm a big believer in self-talk. Mm -hmm. And so I talk to my traders about you know, talking out loud to themselves because if you talk out loud to yourself, it fires up different neural pathways than if you just talk internally. Mm -hmm. Now, I must admit that most of the time I don't talk out loud to myself anymore because I, I've done all of that. And yeah. so I don't want to be arrogant, but I have done all of that. And so I don't need to uh, do a lot of that. But um, but certainly um, I do talk internally. I'm constantly talking to myself about um, certain things. For example, um, a, a typical self-talk would be, okay, I'm looking at this a particular setup here. Um, and the first question I'll always ask myself is, if I take this trade right now and it fails, will I kick myself? You talked about litmus tests earlier on. Um, that is a key litmus test that I will ask myself. Because if I say, yes, I would kick myself if I took that trade and it failed, mm. then it's the wrong trade. And so because every trade that I take... If it fails, it, I shouldn't be kicking myself about it. 
mm. because it you know it, we all have losing trades and they're just part and parcel of trading so there must be something wrong with the analysis if i say yeah actually i might be pushing it a bit there to take that trade and and that question is a great arresting mechanism coming back to my natural propensity to be a greed based trader so it's um yeah that's just one example but certainly um so you're talking about consistent execution then it's key questions that i'm constantly asking myself such as that um to say all oh, right if i bank this profit right now and it carries on going higher will i kick myself well the answer should be no you know but if the answer's well yes that tells me that i i'm i i'm I'm well it, it, I'm getting emotional and I'm wanting to bank profits because I'm sitting on a nice profit and I want to bank it mm -hmm. it's not that's not the answer so I've got to stay with it so it's all that sort of self talk that goes on that helps me to either avoid bad trades or fringe trades should we say I'm not really going to take bad trades but fringe trades um and also to help me stay in trades so it's constantly asking yourself key questions and they will help you to find the answer yeah very good um charlie i think that was very good insight that other traders can also use uh, as well i like that question where you say if i took this trade and fail will i kick myself and i can see that you've definitely put in years and years of um training and asking the right questions to train that mind and i think as you nicely said in especially in trading the psychology part requires a lot of work on, especially getting into peace uh, with every trade that you come out of eventually. Um, Charlie, I think we've completed most of the um, questions over here. So if the audience have any other questions, you can type into the chat box. Uh, as they are doing that, just so that more people can know about you and find out more about you, where can they go to? Um Thanks, Thera. Um, I, yeah, just go to easytrader.com. Um, there's plenty of uh, free content on that website or check out our YouTube channel because we post regular videos on our YouTube channel. So YouTube and look up Easy Trader, E Z W -E, E, and um, and check us out that way. So, yeah, that's certainly a way. Oh, look, you just brought up the website. That's good. Yeah, so you so, would say this one here. And where would, you say, they can, where would you say they can start off? Uh, maybe just... Yeah, I would just say, yeah, just if you go, if they go onto our email list, then they, um, they'll get emails. Most of the emails that go out are just about normally from normal week to week, alerting them to latest videos that may have been posted onto our YouTube channel or onto our, onto our website and stuff. So, um, so yeah, that's a, that's an easy way to be in touch, but have a, they can have a look. There's plenty of resources there. Uh, the media page, lots of interviews and things like that as well. So there's plenty of free stuff on there to have a look at. Okay, great. So I think that's um, for people just to find out more about um, Charlie. If you, if you want to find out more about his way of trading and what he does and all of that, feel free to go on to easytrader.com and find out more. I think um, if there are no other questions just coming up i mean charlie i mean is there anything that you would like to say or add on or show anything as your final last words oh wow um that's open isn't it <laughs> <laughs> so, um i would say i mean i don't know who's going to be watching this interview but um i would what i come across and i'm sure you do as well um when people get into trading is that they have a very short term um horizon Mm -hmm. And so they measure their success via how well they get on in the next six months or 12 months or whatever. And if I could implore or one thing is to really give it a go and giving it a go isn't, oh, I gave it a go for six months and couldn't make money and I quit or 12 months or whatever. Really give it a go and see it as something that's going to walk with you through your life. And so, so then you're taking the pressure off. Most people professionals will go to university and study for three or four years if you're a doctor seven years um you name it it there's it takes years and yet people get into trading and think that they can just read some books go on a trading course or whatever and then instantly going to be successful why do they think that trading is going to be any different to you know any other 
uh, professional career. So really give it a go rather than you know see it as a short term get rich quick thing. Yes, you can make a lot of money quite quickly in trading. That's the one thing that it does appeal. But at the same time, it should you should see it as something that you're going to do for the next 20 years, 30 years. And if you see it that way, you don't care when the market gives you a knock because the market, I can guarantee, is going to slap you around a bit here and there. And you need to be able to get back up and have that tenacity to do that. If you if you have a short-term attitude towards trading, you're more likely not going to get back up and say, well, oh, screw this, I'm not going to, uh, trading's not for me sort of thing. And I think that's a shame. I don't want people to become a statistic, as I often say. And we know the statistics are that, you know, 80% of traders will quit within their first sort of six months or whatever. So um, that would be what I would want to uh, impress upon people is see it as something that if you're getting into it, that this is what something you're going to do for, you know, the next 20, 30 years, 40 years, whatever. You know, Charlie, thanks for sharing that because I think that's a principle that's cross-transferred to um, any profession or any endeavor that you want to succeed in is that look at the long-term horizon, not just the short-term. And I always tell all our clients and all our followers that, and why not? Why not spend time in something that can help you get out of the time and money link that can give you that passive cash flow and look after you in the later part of your years? And I think it's well um, invested and to have that long-term horizon that you are saying is definitely it's a very very good um, advice charlie thanks thanks a lot for being on traders talk with us and for everyone listening in uh, you guys will get all the recording and also the place to go to to learn more about um, charlie as well once again charlie thanks a lot for um, coming on board it's nice having you and thanks ever so much yeah it was um, yeah much appreciated being invited to come along so hopefully um, hopefully there's some some a couple of bits there I always think that if I um, do an interview and, and and someone who's listening in takes one thing from that interview then then it, we've done our job nice uh, that's really nice um, sums it up and as we always say traders till the next time stay disciplined follow your trading plan and keep trading like a master bye everyone